Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to talk to you today. I have been waiting since the Chinese Communist Party attack video and public anti Dalai Lama public relation campaign uh, stormed uh, the world of social media internationally. And they, they operate in 30 countries or something. Their assets, their, their social media assets that they have, like the Russians also, but the Russians may be helping them to try to blacken the name of the Dalai Lama, which they did to gain some form of satisfaction for themselves in revenge for the Dalai Lama's for two things he did. One, he did a stealth trip to Mongolia, stealth trip to Mongolia a year or two ago, I think before COVID was really full blast, and uh, found the reincarnation of the Bogd Lama, namely the Dalai, the, the Dalai Lama of Tibet, the traditional Dalai Lama of Tibet. The previous one had lived to quite a ripe old age, but mostly lived in India in exile because of the communist government in Mongolia, of course, for the last 70, 80 years until the 80s and 90s. And uh, then he went back a little bit to Mongolia. Then he did die, and he's a seven-year-old boy now. And that, anyway, infuriated them, them at the time, as any Dalai Lama watchers will remember. And then on top of that, just recently, a month or so ago, the Dalai Lama initiated that seven-year-old boy, and then he was shown on... on um, on um, video in YouTube of, a, of a, several ceremonies in Dharamsala, and that also infuriated them. So they planned this, and they they saw how their social media manipulator types saw how they could use the Dalai Lama's expression of a traditional Tibetan expression of affection, not sexual affection, grandparent to child affection. And they could use that, and, get, and in the context of all of the scandals in the Catholic Church of pedi, pedio, pedophilia and so on, they could get people to think, oh, Dalai Lama's that, anyway, which is actually an old trope in communist propaganda about Tibet. They hired some Westerners when they first got in in the 50s into Tibet, and they hired Westerners who knew about the Protestant, you know, uh, capitalist, you know, Protestant ethic, capitalist aversion to monks, an assumption that monks are all weirdos. And, um, you know, they they had a wax museum about the Tibetans, and they acted like the Tibetans were the ultimate Borgias, even doing human sacrifice of children and all kind of horrible things. Propaganda, which different people swallowed, even George H.W. Bush, um, after a visit to Tibet in the 80s, he uh, 70s, I think, 70s, 70s, before, yeah, in the 70s, when he was CIA director, he wrote some stuff from um, Newsweek, in Newsweek about visiting that wax museum, and he swallowed that propaganda wholesale at that time. So that's what, this, that's the first context I'm putting this in. The second context is, and I've been waiting <clears throat> to make my own statement in defense of of uh, his holiness, or really, not really, he doesn't need defense. He's the ultimately innocent person, if there ever was, and friendly and loving and, and kind and compassionate and uh, innocent, completely, with no sexual nothing about anybody. And uh, I was waiting to do that, to explain that to people, to see what else came up and whether... And I sensed, when I originally saw the short one, which was a doctored video done by the... Communist Party assets who want to blacken the Dalai Lama as they've always tried to do. You know, he's evil. He's the head of the snake. He's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. All these terrible things. They be demon. He's a demon. They say that, and for, they've been saying it for decades. They always do this to try to disguise their own destruction of Tibet, and out of anger that the Tibetan people are still deeply loyal, and deeply love, and are deeply committed, and dedicated to the spiritual eminence and holiness of his holiness, who has been, who's an 87-year-old celibate monastic, genuine one. I have known him for 60, almost 60, 59 years. And, you know, I was a monk even in his order. I was ordained by him, never laid a hand on me, <laughs> never did anything. 
and nor, nor did any other Tibetan monk ever do anything to me of any kind of that kind of thing, you know, suspicion that they're all sex star weirdos. They never did any such thing. And uh, I've been known them very closely, a close good friend for many, many years, <clears throat> not to mention perhaps many lifetimes. And they're fine. And he is the most innocent person of all, actually showing his affection for that little kid who seemed to need affection. He asked himself, I need a hug, I need a hug, you know. And his mom was right there and she was all into it with the kid. And then afterwards, they were really happy. And afterwards, their mom and the kid said how wonderful it had been their meeting with His Holiness, how delighted. And they broke a coconut. He sort of ambushed again His Holiness on his way out slowly going with the monks holding him up because of his bad knee. And they did a coconut breaking offering with some kind of Indian ritual that is, I'm sure what. And um, so the whole thing is preposterous, really, and ridiculous. Now, on the, on the announcement of this video, uh, there is a link to Jigme La, a wonderful young Tibetan man, who gives a very thorough analysis of this, in all dimensions, extremely excellent, and also plays the full video showing all the interactions, not just sort of taking out a little piece and trying to make it look bad, and then promoting it with negative PR as heavily as they can in 20, 30 languages, which is what the PRC did. And um, so I, I want you all to see that if you're serious about wanting to understand what this is all really about. And, um, and so please do. And then there's another um, uh, text thing that another Tibetan wrote that I'm going to put in there about the, the expression, nge, nge je la sa. you know, in other words, eat, it says literally actually eat my tongue. <laughs> and that's Tibetan's uh, grandparent will do that to a grandchild who, to whom they've already given some candy. They've already had them kiss their grandpa or grandma, either one. And then sort of their kind of pockets are emptied out and they say to the kid, well, what, do you want to eat my tongue? <laughs> and they go like that because Tibetans always do stick out the tongue. You know, the Tibetan to do that, when they do that, if I do that to you online, I go, uh, I said, I'm not just doing a yoga gesture, although that is a yoga gesture even in India to lengthen the tongue, you know, but uh, uh, and relax the tongue muscle by stretching it, you know, like it's a yoga thing. Uh, position for the face. But the Tibetans do that because that shows that you're completely vulnerable and open to the other person and you respect them totally and you're sort of whatever they say or even whatever they breathe, you are ready to inhale it, you know? So you uh, you do like that. And he shows a wonderful old video from old Tibet where a village headman is coming into a group of people who are receiving him and then everybody's got their tongue out, hanging out and that's a little different from the grandparent thing, but it's a very sort of typ typical Tibetan sort of athletic form of physically showing reverence, affection, respect, and so on, and it has nothing sexual about it whatsoever. And um, But the Chinese realize with everybody's so flipped out with social media brainwashing about sexuality that it could be used to try to like line people up in the line the Dalai Lama up in people's minds along with all the child abusing you know little boy mostly little boy abusing Mongolian priest not I mean Catholic priests that have caused scandals and and furor and everything rightly so in many many countries and um, so I mean I'm not blaming them but but uh, so the difficulties of their training and the whole situation there, and, uh, and that's another story. So, they, but anyway, so this is the main thing about this. And then my own testimony has to do with his whole. And I want you to see that, and it's much better than whatever I can say. I have summarized a little bit of its points. But in my case, I have known his holiness since 1964. I was a young person myself. I was whatever, you know, His Holiness or any other Tibetan monk that I hung out with for many years as a monk first, that I reverted myself to lay status simply because there was no support in America, really, but for monks 
And um, my wife is very determined that I will say it like that. She doesn't want to be seen as having lured me away from my celibacy, which I've maintained for three or four years, five, almost five years in my 20s. Uh, and uh, in other words, she wants it to be known for sure that I resigned on principle that and following the advice of my original teacher who said, yes, I know you sincerely want to be a monk for life, but the culture you live in will not support you as a monk for life. Instead, you be a regular lay person, you go to a university, you be a professor, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I did. But I've known him closely and all different Tibetans, and the ones who are celibate are really celibate. They have really celibated their, their sublimated their energy, and they are really, they can be friendly, loving, and energized. They're not anybody's fantasy of someone who's celibate as being somehow deprived because they have, you know, their sort of deep subliminal affectional energies are manifested in their speech and their teaching and their artistic work and their and their general cheerfulness in life and doesn't require the sexual outlet. And, and this, again, in Freudian psychology is practically incomprehensible to the Westerners who think that anybody who's not somehow active in that way must be repressed and messed up. And in fact, they're not. They are sublimating the energy and they are not in any way sexual active or aggressive or sneakily. I mean, in general, you know, obviously there will be bad eggs here and there maybe in the, in the, in the whole millions of Tibetans, but, uh, but uh, definitely not his holiness. His, in fact, his holiness, in the last 70 years, when they've been in exile, he, his own purity and his own strictness, actually, about everything, has, has, has inspired the Tibetan people in exile, where they have hundreds of thousands, they will say 800,000, the media says, but it may be 150 by now, in India, Nepal, and all around the world. And out of them, 15, 20% of the, both males and females are celibate monastics, the equivalent of monks and nuns, mendicants, you know, and they are mostly completely pure. Again, there may be some individual violators of that, but if discovered, they will be kicked out of the monastery. And that's important for them because the place for the real heavy duty spiritual education, the meditation, education, visualization practices that they do is being celibate and not bringing sexuality or family values and, you know, becoming a mendicant monk, male or female, monk or nun in the Buddhist order is I have le I leave the home for the state of homelessness. I leave the family for the for adopting the whole universe as my family, you know, being tr treating everyone, all animals, even not just all humans as sort of living beings like me, being equal to me and equally deserving of my love and care and affection, but, but not sexual procreating and families and all of that. So I can testify from 59 years to the sincerity and the purity and the radical innocence. And actually people, if even looking at the bad video, if you see it, it's just so, he's just so open and so kind. And it's like, ah, you know, <laughs> I'm like, like the Gaga grandpa who's trying to reassure the young kid who said he needed a hug from like the quote under like the highest religious person in the big assembly of hundreds and hundreds of people. And he's showing I'm, I'm everybody's grandpa. And he even says, you can hear in the longer one, we are all equal. We're all one family. We're all brothers and sisters. And he always says that. So he's like being a grandpa or a grandma. And um, he does it in a sweet way, pluck my tongue, which is, which he is editing himself and not saying eat my tongue, which is what the Tibetans would say in Tibetan. But he says that, is, which is actually, and he makes it sound positive, but in a way it's like, don't you have enough now? What do you want to eat my tongue? Is that that thing? That's what it is for a grandpa who, who wants to tell the kid, no more candy, no more coins, no more hugs and kisses. Now you know Grandpa loves you, so now now don't bug me anymore, or do what? Or do you want to eat my tongue? That's that's actually what it's about. Jela sa, you know, means to eat. Jela is honorific for the tongue, and uh, and nge uh, is mine, you know. Jela sa. That's all it is. So come on, let's calm down, everybody. 
do not project that. Those people who are communists and hate religion or who are some kind of secularists that think religions have caused all the murders and all the disasters in history, you can revel in this uh, outrage routine that people are, you know, social media are pumping up, you know, which are all their bots, the Russian bots, the Chinese bots. They, they're even selling it to QAnon people, you know, to anything to go against kindness, peacefulness, you know, optimism, hope, you know, restoring life, you know, giving back the future to Greta Thunberg and this young kid, this young Indian kid and other young people and showing that an older generation genuinely cares for you and wants the planet not to be wrecked so that they can make money, which is what too much of the adults are doing on this planet, why the, the younger generations feel anxious. And so it totally innocently, just being a, Tib a Tibetan, you know, and, and not thinking twice about how Westerners don't understand that, that, don't know that part of the culture. I didn't really know that they're so well personally. After 60 years of knowing them, I didn't really know the weight or the, the, the prevalent widespread thing of that expression. What do you want to eat my tongue? <laughs> I didn't really realize it until this incident. And in a way, I think it will backfire on the CCP as it always has where they try to make out the Tibetans are Borgias, their monks are no good, they're not working day and night for the for the communist dictatorship, imperium, colonialist thing, that are genociding the Tibetan people still today. And we'll get them to abandon Tibet again because they'll get to hate Mr. Tibet, which is his holiness, the Dalai Lama. Everybody knows him and everybody likes him on the planet because he is likable. He's really nice, the best, nicest person. So that's all I wanted to say. I don't want to go on too long. I hope this will go on YouTube. And I hope the links to the young Tibetans who are saying and printing and showing the right way to people about their adored and beloved and highly relied upon and trusted great 14th Holy Dalai Lama of Tibet. They also have a lot to say, and we should listen to them. So I hope you will do that. Thank you for attending to me. I don't know how long this went. I hope it wasn't too long. All the best. Okay? Cheer up. He's not a bad guy. He's not a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's really a very nice old grandpa of hey, willing to be a family member of everyone, adopt everyone as his grandson or granddaughter or brother or sister. Okay? All the best. Thank you.